uh, verse 25. And everyone knows this quite well. He says, uh, for I run in a race, all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. What is Paul talking about here? He's talking about getting that ring on your finger, getting that, that love, that love sign that God has always had for his bride. That's what he was running for, because Paul says this. He says, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperance in all things. Now they do not obtain a perishable crown, for we, for an, for we, an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into supplication, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. What is Paul talking about here? What on earth? This is one of the guys that wrote most of the new, the renewed covenants, which is what the New Testament is. It's a renewed covenant. So what is Paul saying? I could be disqualified. Well, let me just sober you with these things. In, in uh, Matthew 7, verse 21. But we'll start a little bit before that. Let's start at um, verse 17. Even so, every good tree bears good fruits, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruits, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by your fruits you will be known. Not everyone, this is the one that sobers you up. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father in heaven to be about the father's business. But then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Who you who practice lawlessness? What this is what this is what most most Christians I feel get wrong is that yes, we're meant to, you know, we as James says, you know, we, we are not saved um, just through faith. Yes, we are saved through but we will be looking at our works. What is our first principle? Love the Lord with all of your heart. Amen. To love him with everything that we have. Because Jesus says, through my intimacy and my relationship with you, I will know you. And if we're not intimate with him, that's the word that I cannot, I cannot even, it's, it's so, it's so incomprehensible to me that the Lord might even utter this to people. I never knew you depart from me who practice lawlessness so in other words people are doing things in the christian church today as we speak as we go about business they do this the most amazing ministry but that's exactly what it is it's a ministry they're not in love with him they're not drawing people into an intimacy with the one who loves us because it says in in in, in isaiah 62 verse 5 it says the bridegroom rejoices over the bride and God, the Lord, will rejoice over you. This is what Mark was talking about. We've got an engagement ring. We've got a, a, a covenant with him for a marriage feast and a marriage ceremony and the marriage of the Lamb, the supper. This is where we're going. This is what we're inheriting. And what yeah. Paul is saying is we can be disqualified. Why? By not knowing him. But not intimately pursuing him. Can you remember in Matthew uh, chapter 11? Turn with me. Matthew 11, verse... Um, sorry, 22, verse 11. 20, 20, Matthew 22, verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who wasn't there. I saw a man who was there but did not have the right wedding garment on. <coughs> and the king said to the servant, bind him, hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. This is heaven, folks. This is not talking about hell. This man that was in the wedding feast, he was not dressed according to the custom. He hadn't followed the procedure 
of what we've been talking about over these last two weeks. He said, cast them into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And people can say to you, well, there's no weeping, there's no gnashing of teeth. But there is, because every Jew would totally understand that. It's when they would rend their garments and gnash their teeth and cry out of, if only, if only, if only. And what Jesus is saying here is, you've entered in an illegal way to this wedding. We have all been invited because it goes on to then say in verse 14, for many are called. Everyone is called to this. Everybody who is born again, who has looked upon the blood of Jesus, been washed of their sin, everybody has been called. But few choose to go through the right procedure. And what is the right procedure? It is the ketubah. It is the marriage covenant that God has always set up in place. In place. Listen, folks, we have got it so wrong. We have got to go after him with all of our hearts, to love him with everything that we have and all that we've got. We've got to go after him. This is what this lockdown is about, is getting him and being intimate with him. One of the favorite times of my day is when Heidi, me, and Joshua get together and we open up the word and we just read the word and we say, what's the Lord speaking? What's, what's, the, what's come out to you? And then we pray together as a family. That for me is one of the most blessed times of the whole day yeah. where we come together as a family. Why? Because in our house, we want to get to know him. I want to know him. Lord, show me your ways so I may know you. When Jesus, listen, Church, I'm, I'm just saying, we have got things back to front. When Jesus came and said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that is so wrong. Yes, he is the beginning. He is the end. But it was translated from the Hebrew into Greek. And the Greek is when they, they translated the word Alf. I hope Ginny, I pronounced that correctly. Aleph. But Aleph. It's the first... Um, um, alphabetical um, word or letter in the Hebrew um, dictionary. But he also says, I am the Aleph and the Tav. And the Greeks didn't know how to, how to interpret this at all. So they went Alpha and Omega. But that is not what Jesus was saying. Do you want to know what Aleph means? It means the first, the strong leader. That's what it means, the first strong leader. So Jesus is saying, I am the first, the strong, mighty leader. And the Tav, in ancient Hebrew, the Tav was shaped as a cross. This is before even crucifixion came into the historical books. This is a thousand years before crucifixion. So in the Tav that was, 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 was written in, in the ancient Hebrew, it was a prophetic sign of God saying what? Because what does Tav mean? Tav means that basically it's the sign of the covenant. It's the sign when you recognize the cross and what Jesus has did, he is calling his bridegroom back to a covenant with him. So what Mark is talking about is absolutely right. We have all got a covenant ring on our finger. We've all been invited to the marriage feast, but few choose to take the steps into this marriage ceremony, the ketubah, the first cup, the second cup, the third cup. And finally, when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, he said, he said, I will not partake of this grape until I am with you in my father's house. And every Jew would understand what Jesus was saying. He says, I will not partake of this grape until the wedding ceremony, till I'm in my father's house with the wedding ceremony. And so what really, you know, astounded me this week is Richard and Caroline prophetically sent us on, I think, Friday, said, Andy, um, we just made a gift to you. And I know that Mark, had, had, when we were with Mark in Brisbane um, in February, Mark mentioned it to me. But, you know, with, with busyness, it just goes out of your mind. And then um, uh, prophetically, I believe uh, Caroline and Richard sent us a gift on Amazon saying, you know, he, they bought us the film. Um, before the wrath. And I would suggest to every person who's listening to my voice, get hold of that video and, and watch it. Because it's all talking about what we've been talking over the last couple of weeks, about renewing this marriage covenant. 
this ketubah. We go into a contract with the living Lord, the living God who created all things. But Jesus is saying, I am the first sign of, and you know, I'm the beginning and the end, but I am the strong first leader that is going to give you the sign of this, con- of this covenant. So you today, and what we've been on this journey, you today have been on this whole journey of you've been invited into this marriage covenant. <coughs> Are you going to say no? That's what Paul is talking about here. I mean, he was frightened of losing this inheritance because Paul was talking about the third cup of inheritance. He was petrified. He could, he's done all the works. He's done all the signs and wonders, but he was still terrified of not walking into the fullness of the ketubah, the marriage contract of inheritance. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry if I've, um, you know, uh, we didn't record the last two because it would probably help you, but most of you were there. But just to run over it, because I want to talk to you a little bit about this, because the whole thing of the tab, it's through the cross, it was to call us back to a marriage contract. Not just salvation, it was so much more than salvation, folks. It was about entering into a relationship with the one who loves us. Who is this I see coming out of the wilderness? Leaning on the beloved. You can link that prophetically to Isaiah 63, Micah 2, of the bride coming out of the the desert from Revelation 12. These are dots that you can just prophetically link up. Because Jesus is coming back. And he is coming back for a glorious bride, you and me. But we've got to pay the price. What Mark said, that when you put this engagement ring on, it's going to cost you what? Everything everything you are not here for yourselves because god had an intent when he created us for an expression of himself that was our intent is to be an expression of the father and what is that expression love For the banner over me is love. He refreshes me with cakes of raisins and with the freshness of apples. Because I am lovesick. Are you lovesick for him? Do you want him above anything else? And the answer must be, if you are to obtain and enter into this marriage feast where where, where everybody enters into the marriage of the Lamb, suddenly the doors are closed. But have you paid the price to put on the the bridal garments that is required? You know, God has order. And the first part of the the contract, as I spoke about last week in the ketubah, is the first cup of the covenant, is the blood covenant. It's the one of serving. It's the one that that when God, when, when Adam stuffed up and he literally issued the writ of divorce, when he ate out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, I don't want to be married to you. I mean, that's, that's just staggering. But he was in love with his bride. That's what people forget. Adam was in love with his bride. And it would cost him his life, that love for his bride. As Jesus paid the price with his life. For who? His bride. To bring us back to our original intent for that marriage to his son that's what you've been born for because look when jesus performed his first miracle where was it a marriage feast and what did he do he changed the water into wine and the best wine came out last which is totally you know not the custom of 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 a hebrew wedding they let people get sozzled on the good one before they brought out the bad one because then they wouldn't notice a difference But when they brought out the good wine, prophetically, we know what the message is. In a marriage covenant, he is going to bring out his bride, his best. And his best is going to be the answer to all of these problems in the world. Listen, you know, there's only, we we can get on our hands and knees and repent for this country. And it isn't going to make a blind bit of difference. Not a blind bit of difference. We can intercede and we can confess But my thing is this, Lord, Lord, now 
absolutely impregnate me with your presence, with you, and with you in me for the world to see. This is, you know, the glory of God in me, him in me to make a difference to this world. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. But we've got to pay the price. We've got to have that first cup of betrothal, which is sacrifice. And it is a servant heart. We've got to serve him. You know, first seek his kingdom. Matthew 6, verse 33. First seek him and his righteousness. And all these other things will just slip into place. But have you paid that price? Have you sacrificed yourself? Have you laid yourself on that altar and said, in you only, Lord, that I am going to follow? In you only, Lord, there is nothing of this world that is going to pull me away from you. Lord, I pray now for you, Holy Spirit, to, <laughs> to enable me to step into that, that nothing of this world. So when the devil came to Jesus, as Jesus said, when the devil came to me, he found nothing in me that would agree with him. Can you say the same thing? As for me and my house, I'm going after him. I, and and all, all we want to do is have a bunch of people that are in love with Jesus. In love with him. It's simple. For what though? It's for a fulfillment of a marriage contract. That's our ultimate prize. To be married to him. But many, everybody is called. Everyone is called to this. I don't care about what circumstances you are in. You are called for this. But will you pay the price? Will you pay the price? Because we then go into the second cup of betrothal. This is all in the Ketubah marriage ceremony. This is what they have to do. The second one is because Jesus through his blood has purified, but he wants to restore us. I am the sign of the covenant. I want to restore you back to this original covenant through my blood. This is what the communion table is all about. It's a renewing of this blood covenant. It's the renewing when we break the bread of the soul covenant, which is the second cup of betrothal, which is basically represented by Abraham. And I'm going to speak about Abraham in a minute because I want to show you something of what Abraham, how he got this. He first went from... Um, he, he recognized the first cup of betrothal, which was service, a servant heart. And when I started and delved into Abraham's life, I'm staggered, absolutely staggered what price he had to pay. The price that Abraham had to say. Because Abraham, you know, he, he um, and I'm going to, we're going to come to it, you know, um, he made a salt covenant, a salt covenant with the Lord, you know, which is the second cup of betrothal. And it was called the soul covenant of hospitality and friendship. I want to be a friend of the Lord. No longer do I call you servants. This is the qualification that the disciples had to do. When Jesus said to them, no longer do I call you a servant. They've qualified, but I call you a friend. This is in John. <coughs> The Gospel of John, no longer do I call you a servant, but I call you a friend. And whenever the Father shows me, I will show you. Do you want to have the Father's heart and be shown? I do. Because this is the only way that we're going to make a difference, is when we have him in us, the hope of glory to this world. That we can go out and be about the Father's business, as it says in Daniel. You know, I want to be about the Father's business. And what's the father's business? To bring people into his kingdom for a marriage covenant. The bride. It's the bride that he is after. It's all about the bride. But in this film, in this film, you know, of um, um, Before the Wrath. Now, I, I, as I saw these people come up watching on, on Friday, I knew them. Um, and they're all good men, you know, and good women. They're, they're, they're all good people. But... In my opinion, they miss it because I know what they say. You know, I've, and these are some of the people with some of the biggest churches in America. And they all believe that we, the church, is taken up before even the Antichrist comes on the political scene, before the seven years. 
because they base it on the fact is when the marriage supper, the marriage supper comes, it's not the marriage ceremony and it isn't the marriage feast, but when the marriage supper comes, the doors are shut for seven years. Seven days. Sorry, seven days, seven years, which is what they're saying prophetically that represents. Well, they, they um, suggest that, don't they? they? Well, they don't really say it, but that's they suggest they put the suggestion in because of that, you know, the bride is going to be, or the, the church is going to be raptured up. That's for me just doesn't make sense because when you look at the marriage feast or the marriage ceremony, the bride is outside of the hooper. You know, the, 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 the tent. And who's standing in the middle of the hooper? It's the bridegroom and the father. You know, it's the father and the bridegroom. But what does the bride do before she goes in to the ketubah? She walks around the ketubah seven times. So it, she walks around that hooper seven times before she's allowed in, which for me prophetically speaks of this doesn't happen until going through the tribulation. We're going to go through some of this. We're going to, we're going to be seeing what, what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark 13, you know, um, he said, you know, the world has never seen what is coming because you're going to go through tribulation and trials. We're guaranteed it. But he says, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Because when we look at what Daniel, in Daniel, when, when Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego were thrown into that furnace, it was heated up seven times. It's prophetically speaking, like you are going to be heated up seven times like the world has never seen. In the last seven years, the last week, that Daniel was talking about. But who was walking in there with them? Jesus. And they came out with all of their bondage burnt off. Yay. Walking. They didn't even smell of the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar, who's that walking in? I thought there were three, but there's four. Because Jesus is going to be with his bride all the way through this. And we will be victorious. Awesome. We will be victorious. Victorious because we are fighting to be at his side right in the middle of the, the, the hooper, the marriage. I want to be married to him. Yeah. And we've got to go after him. But Abraham qualified because we know the story. But here we have it. I mean, if you want to follow some of it, it's in Genesis 12. Um, with with Abraham, but Abraham followed it because Abraham was an old man. He was 75 years old, 75 before God called him. And God is calling us today. Come, pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up everything of yourself. Give everything of yourself and follow me. Because Abraham at 75, there he is, He's got a nice, comfortable life. And look what God says in verse 1 and 3. Is everyone with me in Genesis 12? Verse 1 and 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse you, curse him who curses you. And in all of your families of that earth shall be blessed. But what, what did Abraham have to do? He had to be obedient. He left everything. He left everything. He left his family. He left his parents. He left everything. At the age of 75, he left everything. And it says, get out and separate yourself. Separate yourself, Abraham. Get out of this. Separate yourself. And this is what he is calling us to do, is to separate ourselves from this world because we've been called to a higher calling. But Abraham, like a servant, was obedient. And you know, what, what he did, if you have a look in verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give you this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. 
So this is God pursuing Abraham. God has been obedient to the call that was on his life. He's done everything as a servant heart that God has called him to be. And now he builds an altar to the Lord as a reminder of what? The covenant. He is reminding the Lord, Lord, I'm going to build this altar to you as a sign of this covenant you've made with me. As a sign of the covenant that you've made with me, this altar is an altar to remind us of this salt covenant. But he hadn't qualified for the salt covenant yet. That comes later. He is now, you know, entering into a time when he was 86 years old when he had Ishmael. But God gave him a promise. You know, he said, look, I will, you know, Sarah, they, they didn't have any children. They were, they were motherless and fatherless. They didn't have children at this point. But God promised, you know, I'm going to make you and your descendants inherit this land. And, and Sarah and Abraham um, must have looked at each other and go, he must be talking about somebody else. But God is talking to us today. I'm going to make you a blessing for these nations. Don't you want to be a blessing for this nation? Don't you want to be a blessing for the United Kingdom? Remember what we were talking about on Wednesday, you know, uh, about the dream that Joshua had and that uh, in the dream, you know, that there was, you know, you have to be there. But Joshua had a very prophetic dream because, folks, what is going to go from this nation is going to go out to other nations. Because this is the, you know, we, we've got a Christian heritage that has gone as, not as long as the is, Israeli covenant. But Paul said, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. We've been called in a union of this covenant. The, the time now is to answer the call. The time now is to answer that call and say, God, I'm going after you. I'm going to leave whatever, even if it's the cost of my family, I'm going to follow you. Even if it's the cost of leaving my family, I'm going after you. There's the price you have to pay. What is ever separating you from this, get rid of it. Put it on the altar. And here's another suggestion. Get on the altar with it. That you become that living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto the Lord. Because I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ, I want you to live in all your fullness in me. But then at 99, here's one, men, listen to this. Listen to a sign of a covenant because God was making a covenant with Abraham here. He was renewing the covenant that he first made with Adam. It's the second cup of that betrothal of the ketubah, the contract, the marriage contract. And he constantly was renewing this contract. And he said, look at uh, chapter 17. Just jump with me to 17. This will make every man in this watching this squirm because at the age of 99 he made a marriage covenant so if you look at 17 verse 1 when abraham was 99 years old years old the lord appeared to him and said i am the almighty god walk before me and be blameless in other words be holy and i will make a covenant between you and me this is abraham renewing this covenant i will make a covenant with between you and me you know, and it says, and you will multiply, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God was talking to him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, Abraham. My covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Listen, we are, we are part of that nation. Those nations wasn't just talking about Israel. It's talking about us as a nation. But we've got to renew that covenant. We've got to walk with the Lord in that covenant, just like Abraham. We've got to put on the altar what is most precious to us. But look what he did. He made this covenant in verse 7 of chapter 17. <clears throat> and I will, establish, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants and all in your generation with an everlasting covenant. What is he talking about? He's talking about the marriage covenant of the Lamb. He's talking about, get ready, bride, I'm coming to you. I'm coming for you. My first, my best, my, my only one is coming as a sign of this contract of marriage for you and me. 
This, co this covenant hasn't been fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled in your, your lifetime and mine. Because we will see him come back. But I do not want to be on that door hammering it. Remember when the father comes to the door and he hammers on the door and whoever hears his voice and opens up the door is talking about the marriage contract. Let me in so I can make this contract between you and my, you, your family and my family. Because it's the father of the bride that sticks his head out and says, shall I let him in? Talks to the bride to be, shall I let this in? And then we'll go through the process of this marriage contract. So this is what it's talking about. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Because Jesus wants to enter into a marriage contract with you and me. Isn't that amazing? But what did Abraham have to do? At the age of 99, Dr. Ian Grant, the age of 99, this could have killed him. He had to circumcise himself as a sign saying, right, I'm not going to be like the rest. I'm going to circumcise. And he gave, he gave Abraham instruction to do this after eight days. Only because after eight days and a young child, the blood platelets are there and it stops the clotting of the, it helps the clotting of the blood or the circumcision. But Abraham had to do this at 99. And then God makes another promise to Abraham. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a son. And then even Abraham and Sarah laugh. What, me? Sarah's looking at herself. I'm 99. He's an old man. And you're going to give us a son? And she laughs. And the Lord hears her. Where does he, where does he hear her? Because he makes now, he's, Abraham is qualifying for the soul covenant. Turn with me to chapter 18. This is where the soul covenant was made. This is where the salt was put in the bread. And Jesus is here with, with and the Lord appeared to him by the, what we call the, 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 um, the, 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 tree, the myrtle tree. He appeared to him and was sitting in the tent, in the door, the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing by him and he saw them and, they, and he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground because he recognized his, his beloved. He recognized it was Jesus, his beloved. And he fell prostrate on the ground. And the first thing he says, please, please, Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. There's the word servant. Do not pass by your servant. And Jesus, God is pursuing Abraham for the second cup of the betrothal, of the soul covenant. Please let a little water be brought to wash your feet. And rest yourself under the tree. Hospitality. And I will bring a morsel of bread. And in that bread would be the salt. The salt covenant. That you may refresh your hearts. Why? Refresh his hearts for what? Because he's entering in to a marriage contract. And it's going to refresh the Lord Jesus. Because this is what he's after. He's after you and me as a bride. That you, that, and after that, you may pass by and as much that you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. And then we know that Abraham rushed away and he got, he made the preparations and he had hospitality and friendship with the Lord. But what really qualified, what really qualified him is what we see in chapter 19 is that Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, God said, I'm going to destroy this. I'm going to destroy these people. Um, and remember when, when um, Lot and, and his family came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, when God destroyed it, sent the two angels in there <coughs> to completely wipe it out because it had become a, an absolute disgrace and it offended the Lord. And he called Lot and his wife out. Listen, folks, he told them not to look back. But, but Lot's wife turned back. Why? Because she looked back thinking, oh my word, what am I walking away from? I'm walking away from my life. Boom, what was she turned into? Salt. Because in the covenant, you had to return all of the salt back to the person you'd made that covenant with. If you wanted to break it. Lot's wife broke that covenant. And the salt was returned back to her. I haven't read this in a book. I haven't got it out of a book. This is just a thought, a process. <clears throat> Maybe it's prophetic, I don't know. But the covenant was saying to Lot's wife, you've broken it. Because you want, you want what's in that city. 
and she had to come out with me. Follow your husband, come out because I want to bring you into our high covenant. But God did not break his promise to Abraham. How do we know that? Chapter 21. Chapter 21, at the age of 100, God did not break his covenant, did not break his promise. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at a set time of which the Lord had spoken to him. And we know that that, uh, God... um, allowed you know Sarah's womb to open and Ab- and, and Abraham um, seed to come forth and, and Isaac was born could you imagine the delight of Abraham finally with his beloved his Sarah birthing a man folks what came out of the woman in chapter 12 of Revelation a man it's a child it's a man child same thing Isaac came out of Sarah, is prophetically saying, I'm having my bride. This is, I'm, through this, your descendants, Abraham, I'm going to have my bride. I'm after you, Abraham. And through your son, this birthing of your son, I'm going to have my bride. But look what Abraham had to do. Just follow it. And this was the testing in, in chapter 22 of Abraham. Now, could you imagine this? Now, Abraham... I've got a final thing for you. You've got to pass the test. But it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. God is testing us through this coronavirus and where our hearts are. He's giving us a test. Where is your heart? Is your heart going to hunker to watch the television in this time more than it is to go after me? Is your heart going to be going after them, missing the things in this world rather than going after me? Are you hunkering like Lot's wife? Are you hunkering for what's out there rather than going after me? Well, lay yourself on the altar. Give everything unto the Lord. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a test. And Abraham says, here I am. And he said, now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And go to the land of Moriah, 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 sorry, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall tell you. Listen, folks, I think prophetically that mountain that Abraham, they saw it off from afar, was a mountain. And I believe where that sacrifice was going to take place with Isaac was exactly where Jesus, uh, over 2,000 years later, would be crucified. I believe it's the very place that when Abraham put the wood on Isaac's back was the very place that the wood of the cross was where Jesus carried it out of Jerusalem. And he carried it up to Golgotha. And I believe that prophetically this is where it all took place. It's because Jesus, Isaac was the sign of this covenant of Jesus fulfilling a covenant with his bride. But Abraham was playing it out. It was a dress rehearsal. And you, know, you can get all of that from the covenant with, with Moses. It's a dress rehearsal. It's a micro dress rehearsal of what was to come. And it says, you know, we know the story. Could you imagine that? Isaac and Abraham walking for three days. <coughs> and Abraham turning and saying that he's knowing what he's going to do. And then Isaac says, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Isaac, put the wood on the floor. And he bound him. And Isaac knows, oh, my word, Lord, what are you, Father, what are you doing to me? He says, you're the sacrifice. This is the test. Are you ready to give up everything for him? Are you sure? Everything? All of your desires? And then Abraham, boom, was bringing down that knife. He was doing it. He was bringing down a knife on his beloved. And then, boom, the angel stopped him. And then there's a ram. And look what it says. Do not lay your hand on the hat in chapter 22, verse 12. Do not lay your hand on the lad. Isn't that beautiful? Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. 
that Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by the, by the horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And the Lord, and Abraham called the place, the place. Where is that place? It was Golgotha. It was where Jesus was going to be sacrificed. And he said, the Lord, the Lord will provide, as it said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. He's talking about Golgotha and that Jesus would become the ultimate sacrifice. This is how Abraham qualified. He passed the test. Incredible. He's now becomes a friend of God so, through and through. Folks, are you ready to go into a salt covenant with him? <coughs> are you ready to do this as a salt covenant? He obeyed God always. And then look in chapter 24. Now Abraham was old, was, was old, well advanced in his age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham with many things. But that wasn't the end of it. Look at chapter 25, verse 1. Abraham again took a wife. This is after Sarah had, uh, had died. Sarah had died. He took another wife. And she bore him sons and daughters. This is Abraham in his, in his vintage years. Sarah had died, I think, at 125. But Abraham, in his vintage years, produced another family. And, and these were all descendants. Why? Because we're part of that. From the descendants of Abraham. And because of Abraham's servant heart, he qualified for the blessings of nations. This is amazing. It's the blessing of nations. Do you want this nation to be blessed? <coughs> I do. Do you want Australia to be blessed, Mark? Of course you do. Well, we've got to enter into a salt covenant. We've got to go through the sacrifice of laying our lives on the altar to enter into a salt covenant with the Lord of friendship and hospitality. And I haven't even got as far as Jacob. It's getting on time. Yeah, it's getting on time. So I'm not even going to go into <laughs> Jacob because Jacob was the other side of it on, on the menorah, hanging on the menorah alongside, right alongside Abraham because he renewed the covenant. But I'll come on to that maybe next week. But folks, you know, I cannot tell you enough how this time to use this time both spiritually and physically to get your bodies ready. I don't want the Lord to be marrying a fat bride. <laughs> I want him to be marrying a fit bride, fit for purpose, both spiritually and physically. So, you know, I'm, I'm making, I'm going to make videos this week and I've helped my mum, you know, uh, with fitness. My mum is 90 years old, folks. 90 years old and she's fitter than most 60 year olds yep. i was giving her these exercises she said, and she said andrew that's too easy for me i said okay mum, we'll make it harder do this and she's all oh, that's right i can feel that and she's 90 years old prophetically i think my mum is a representation of the bride preparing herself it's the bride preparing herself heidi's in the gym joshua's in the gym you know we're, we're all getting fit as well as spiritually going after God like never before. Mark talks about this. I've written about this. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, both spiritually and physically. That's what it says. And it's your duty to look after this temple. So folks, I just want to invite you to go after him in this time. You go after Jesus with everything you've got. And by the way, watch the video. I'll put it up sometime this week with Heidi's help, um, I'm going to show you exercises and I want everybody to do them. Stay this is your stay at home exercises. <laughs> I want you to do these exercises and, and, and I don't care in what physical condition you're in because there's something in there for everyone, whether you're an elite athlete or a couch potato or a 90 year old woman who was fitter than most 60 year olds. I said to my mum, I said, mum, do me a leg raise. And uh, oh, mum, okay, stop, stop, mum, <laughs> stop. Right? Yeah, because you've done too many now. <laughs> you know, and I'm telling you now, most people wouldn't be able to do it. 
Heidi did, well, I'm telling you, Heidi did five. My mum was doing 10. I did 30 yesterday. You hear that? I'm doing 30 yesterday. But my mum, you know, and, and, and folks, so we got, we use this time constructively. Use this time to get yourself fit, both spiritually and physically, in your house. And if there's anything that is in your house that shouldn't be, whether it's spiritual or physical, get rid of it. Because God is calling for a clean, pure-hearted bride. He, is, he, is, he, he will enable us to do this, as Hardy is shouting in the background. He will he'll give us the grace for this. But now is the time to clean up your house. Both this house and this house. Clean it up and go after Jesus. Amen. Thank you for bearing with me. We're going to go into this ketubah. We're not getting off this subject because this is our calling. This is our whole purpose because he was the sign of the covenant. The renewing of this covenant. That's the New Testament. Don't call it the New Testament. It's a renewing of a covenant. And most of it came from the Old Covenant. The Old Testament. The Old Covenant. So God Can I say something? Can I just put a comment in, an encouragement, Andy? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just relating to Matthew twenty-two eleven, 11, you know, the story of the, you know, the banquet. And there is a thought um, in scripture, in the story of Esther and Mordecai, Mordecai that when yeah. he was rewarded, he was given a suit from the king, clothes from the king. And in, in Matthew 22, there is a, a thought also that at the, at the entrance of the wedding feast, there would have been garments available of the king that yeah. had his perfume and the essence of him upon him, upon yeah. uh, given to the one who's going in. And sometimes in our prophetic stuff, we give people garments on the way in, you know, just garments of praise to come in with as a prophetic sign that we have to clothe ourselves. So I was just thinking about the man who refused it. And we can refuse the essence of the Lord, his perfume, the intimacy. Yeah. Just wanted to make that comment. Absolutely. That's what, that's what many are called. Everyone's called into this, Ginny. Everybody is called to pick up the garment. Everybody. Everybody. 